Okay, hi there, it's Jeff back again with another video on development. What I thought I'd do here is something slightly different. Just spend a few minutes, if it's okay with you, uh, mentioning 10 economists, or maybe 10 and a half, and just offering the shortest of summaries on their contribution to economic thinking and policy making when it comes to development. In the I hope that maybe you can use one or two of these names in your exam paper. So here we go. Here are 10 perspectives on development. Uh, Ricardo, so you'll be revising your trade uh, uh, theory, your specialisation in trade theory. And of course, Ricardo uh, devised, developed the theory of comparative advantage and the gains that are available from specialisation and trade. So whenever you're writing about trade uh, between countries in goods and services, you are unleashing your inner Ricardo. And the idea, of course, the fundamental idea there is there are mutual gains from trade between countries uh, in trading goods, trading services, trade often in ideas, uh, free movement of people and capital. Open markets is essentially still built on that idea of comparative advantage. It's a powerful concept, and I'm sure you'll be using it. One of my favourite development economists, you probably may not have heard of him, is Ricardo Hausmann, who is a professor of development at Harvard. And he talks about the need for countries to, uh, to move up from low to middle to high income, that transition, that, uh, that process that many countries strive for. Development requires increased capabilities and complexity. So countries need to become uh, able to produce a wider range of products, uh, greater diversification, and crucially, they need to be able to develop the human capital, the networks of information, the, uh, the education and the skills to become more capable and complex. And I think South Korea is a really good example of that. They've become a much more complex economy, almost on a par now with Japan and Germany. Of course, that's helped lift them to high income status. Professor Paul Romer made significant contributions to development economics. In particular, he focused on the externalities, the positive externalities from improved human capital. So he was an endogenous growth theorist who argued that there were significant social gains from dollars invested in education as poverty reduction policies, particularly early years education, increasing the, uh, the average mean expected years of schooling, the quality of schooling, and of course, closing that gap between male and female education, which is a, such a transparent part of the Human Development Index. So Paul Romer, externalities from improved human capital. Paul Krugman essentially got his Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking work in trade theory. In particular, he challenged the idea that there would be constant returns from specialisation. He, he focused on the idea of ec uh, economies of scale, that if countries specialise in copper production or motor car manufacturing, whatever it is, there could be some significant internal and external economies of scale which can accelerate the growth and development process, and uh, in particular, the externalities of agglomeration, where you get clusters of businesses and industries, uh, the rise of uh, agglomeration effects in cities, for example, well worth understanding. Paul Collier, Professor Paul Collier, uh, latterly of the World Bank and Oxford University, a famous book, The Bottom Billion, looked at extreme poverty in the poorest billion people in the world, and he argued this was a result of complex market failures, Market failures in education, in healthcare, in housing, lots of different market failures. And he argued it needed coordinated action at a global level. So it wasn't, you know, individual countries often had little, well, not much they could do at an individual level. So we argued for a global perspective on this one, including reforming the way aid is handed out, for example. And he also said that major development gains from urbanisation could be generated. He's argued that no country on the planet has grown rich without urbanising first, and that countries should diversify to help overcome primary product dependency. And I'm sure in a vision you'll be thinking about countries that have managed to do that, particularly if they develop things like capabilities and capacity in financial services, in tourism, in business services, uh, light manufacturing and so on. Diversification, absolutely key. Uh, Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson wrote a book, famous book, their influential called Why Nations Fail. And they argued that fundamentally, 
the failure to achieve development goals was down to government failure and institutional failures, including high levels of corruption, uh, poorly poorly functioning civil service, uh, and and uh, and basically shallow institutions. So weaknesses in terms of the courts upholding the rule of law, um, uh, the, the ability of powerful elites to extract rent from their investments and that money not to find its way into taxation and public services. So essentially, that's the and Robinson all about institutional failure, or you may well have covered this, government failure in your first year economics. Dambisa Moyo, former Goldman Sachs economist, wrote a book called Dead Aid, and she argued that actually overseas aid far from adding to potential GDP and growth and development, can actually have a negative impact, not least because often aid flows just disappear uh, into the hands of corrupt officials, and aid can often embolden corrupt officials and corrupt governments. Uh, I said ten and a half because uh, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther De Flo, they've written many books, of course they've now got the Nobel Prize, in economics for their work in development economics. Uh, they've written books such as Poor Economics and um, Good Economics for Hard Times. And again, they link extreme poverty to market failures. So endemic, you know, the problems of, of scarcity of income and, and poor nutrition and things, absence of health care, are deep, rooted in deeply, deeply persistent market failures. They argue instead of the big state approach, instead of the big golden ticket approach, if you like, pumping lots of money into, into countries. They actually go for a micro-based approach. They argue that small, specific interventions can have powerful effects, particularly if you use randomised trials. So this is where you, you test a policy in the field to see if it works before you then widen it out, expand it to a nation or beyond. <clears throat> Pardon me. So things like conditional cash transfers um, as a way of trying to encourage parents to have their children immunised or to attend school. Uh, a lot of the work at the moment is the idea of randomised trials testing things like universal basic income to see if that might be an effective anti-poverty policy. Uh, Banerjee and Flow, two extremely influential high-profile economists, and I think a top development economics paper uh, will mention those two. Hernando de Soto approaches development from the point of view of what are the conditions required for businesses to flourish, both existing corporations and firms, and also the opportunity, the time it takes and the cost to set up new businesses to inculcate an entrepreneurial culture. And Hernando de Soto uh, makes a strong case for safeguarding and strengthening property rights. He argues that property rights are essential for the private sector to flourish and also for the government to identify who's earning money, who's earning profits, to generate sufficient tax revenues to pay for public services. Ha Jun Chang, famous economist, uh, supports the expansion of a develop developmental state. Uh, this is the idea of an interventionist approach. So he would make the case for saying that uh, intervention can be powerful in terms of driving development, including protectionism designed to accelerate industrial comparative advantage. And he often quotes his home country, South Korea, in that context. But the idea of a devel developmental state, if you get it right, is that the state can often be quite a powerful driver of growth and development, particularly if they test and target their policies and make every dollar count in the areas of things like healthcare, education, broadening the industrial base and accelerating the transformation of economies away from agriculture and, and primary product dependency to a much more diversified state. Well, I hope that was useful. I just thought I'd mention 10 economists, 10 and a half economists, and a little summary of what their thinking is. You may have already looked at some of them, uh, but hopefully a useful little summary uh, to impress the examiners with. Stay positive, stay happy. See you soon.